Hello and welcome to Food Composition Explained. My name is Fernanda Grande and in this video I'm going to talk about recipe calculation procedures. When we are developing or updating a food composition table, recipe calculation is one of the last steps that we do during this process. But also, users can make the recipe calculation if the recipe that you are looking for are not presented in a certain food composition table. So, let's see how we make these procedures. If we are preparing or updating a food composition table for a country, for example, we need to include all the foods that are consumed by the given population. So this means that we need to include in our food composition table raw foods or foods as purchased. We also need to include data regarding the biodiversity of this country. Another category of foods that we need to include are the processed foods. But we also need to include cooked foods and mixed dishes. And if we think these last two, they represent the foods as consumed in a country. So most of the foods are consumed either cooked or as mixed dishes. So this is why this category is extremely important in a food composition table. But having the mixed dishes in a food composition table may be very challenging. And why? Because they vary a lot from person to person. So the ingredients that we use, the amounts, and also the preparation met methods, they can change from one person to another person. And if, if we think about ourselves, it's very common that we don't prepare the same recipe using exactly the same ingredients in different days. So as a consequence of all these variations that we find in mixed dishes, we usually don't analyze, we don't produce analytical values for recipes for mixed dishes. What we make in food composition table is to calculate, to estimate the nutrient content of these foods based on the composition of the ingredients. So we basically have two uh, different types of recipe calculation procedures. We have the single ingredient recipes like boiled potatoes or we have multi-ingredient recipes, for example, a cake. And this is what we are going to discuss here. We are going to see how we calculate the nutrient content for multi-ingredient recipes. Now let's see what kind of information we need to make this recipe calculation. So let's take an example and here we have orange cake. So if I have an orange cake, I need to know exactly what are the ingredients that are used to make this cake. So here in our example we have butter, orange, flour, baking soda, eggs and sugar. So what we need? We need to know exactly the ingredients and the amount that we need to make the cake. So for example, I can't have only two tablespoons of butter. No, I need to have exactly the weight that we need to prepare the cake. So I need the list of the ingredients and the amount for each of these ingredients. In addition, we also need to know the composition, the nutrient profile for all these ingredients. So I need a food composition table with the composition of all the single ingredients that compose the recipe that I want to calculate. So based in this information, what is the next step? We need to know the final weight of this recipe. So how much cake I can produce, I can make, with the ingredients that I'm using. And this is the yield factor. So the yield factor will indicate the losses or gain of water or fat when we prepare a recipe. So for example, when we bake a cake, we will have that the sum of the raw ingredients will be higher than the final weight of the cake because it will lose water during the baking process. So this is why we need to know the yield factor. So based in all these details, I can estimate the nutrient profile of this cake. 
But now you may be thinking, is it a very precise method to estimate the nutrient content of a recipe? Wouldn't it be better to analyze the food? For sure, when we analyze the food, we have a more precise value. But let's think together. So if I go to the supermarket and buy all the ingredients to prepare the recipe that I want to analyze, then I will prepare it and uh, generate the analytical data. Of course, that I will have a very precise value for that recipe that I have prepared. But if I go to another supermarket or if in another day I go to the supermarket and buy the same ingredients again and prepare the recipe and then analyze, of course that I will have I will find a variation of these analytical values. And why? Because there are many factors that affect the composition of foods. So anyway, I will have a certain level of variation that is related to the natural variation of the composition of the ingredients. But on the other hand, if I estimate the nutrient profile of a recipe using the appropriate procedures for recipe calculation, I will have for sure a higher variation in the nutrient content because it's not only regarding the composition of the ingredients but also regarding the uh, assumptions and the estimations that we make when we calculate recipes. But then, when we think about the variation inter and intra-individual in recipe preparations, this variation is huge. So if I ask two people to prepare a mixed dish, they will use their own recipes and we will have all that variations regarding the ingredients, the amount and the preparation methods that will result in a very high variation. So when we think about this huge variation that we have in the preparation of the recipe, the variation that we find here when we compare the analytical value with the estimations is not that important. Of course, this value will be always more precise, but we can use the recipe calculation using appropriate procedures to estimate the nutrient content of recipes. So we can focus, we can produce high quality and analytical data for the ingredients, and then we can estimate a lot of different recipes using the high quality data for the uh, ingredients. So now let's see what are the steps for recipe calculations. So the first step is to select the recipe that we want to include in the food composition table and make the naming the uh, recipe description, the food description. So after choosing the recipe, we need to collect the information for the given recipe. We need to know all the ingredients that we need and the amount that will be used of each ingredient and finally the final weight of this recipe. Then we need to find complete and good quality nutrient profile for all ingredients in the database. So, as I said before, we need to know the nutrient profile for each ingredient to be able to calculate the uh, nutrient profile of the full recipe. So, after having all the details regarding the ingredients, we need to select the appropriate recipe calculation method, the yield factors, and also the retention factors. And if we have a software or an Excel file that can help us in these calculations, it will be very useful. So, after going through these four first steps, we can actually calculate the nutrient values of the recipe, and we can't forget that it's extremely important that we make the documentation. So basically, in addition to the details that we need for the ingredients, we need these two pieces of information. We need the yield factor and we need also the nutrient retention factors. And now we will see for what we use each of these factors. So the first one is the yield factor. And as I mentioned before, yield factor adjusts for losses or gains of water or fat during the preparation. So to calculate the yield factor, we need to know the final weight of the prepared food. So in our example, we need to know the weight of the cake at the end. 
and we need to know the weight of all the raw ingredients. And once we have these two values, we can estimate the yield factor using this formula. So let's see here some examples. So for baked potato, for example, we have that the yield factor is 0.81. It means that 19% of the weight of potato is lost during cooking. So if we bake 100 grams of raw potato, at the end, after baking, we will have 81 grams of baked potato. But if we see here potato steamed, the, the yield factor is 1. It means that the weight before and after cooking is the same, so we don't lose or gain water. But if we take here the last example, macaroni dry, that was boiled and then drained, the yield factor is 2.7. It means that if we boil 100 grams of dry macaroni, after cooking we will have 270 grams. And all this additional weight corresponds to the water that was absorbed during cooking. And here I want to make an important note regarding the water that is absorbed during cooking. So for this type of foods, it's more appropriate if we include the water, the amount that was absorbed, as an ingredient in our calculations. So in this way, we can account for the minerals from water in our calculations. So where can we find the yield factors? We can find them in the literature, especially for the single ingredient recipes, or we can use our own estimations. And when we talk about the mixed dishes, this is the ideal method. So we will be sure that the amount of the ingredients and the preparation methods that we are using really corresponds to that uh, yield factor that we are applying in our recipe calculations. And this is crucial for having a good quality value at the end. The other factor that we need to use is the nutrient retention factor. And the nutrient retention factor takes into consideration the losses of nutrients during preparation. So, Taking our, ex our cake example again, we can't consider that all vitamin C that is present in the orange will be present also in the baked cake, because we will lose vitamin C during the baking, during the cooking procedure. So this is why we need to apply the re nutrient retention factors. We need to take into account these losses that we have during the preparation of foods. So the nutrient retention factor is defined as a coefficient that expresses the preservation of nutrients after preparation. And we usually apply the nutrient retention factors only to minerals and vitamins. So taking here an example, if we have that the retention factor is 0.7 for folate in roasted meat, it means that the roasted meat loses 30% of its folate content during preparation. So in addition to adjusting to the losses or gains of water or fat, we also need to adjust for this type of losses of vitamins and minerals. Nutrient retention factors are specific to the type of food, to the nutrient, and also to the preparation method. And it depends on the cooking method because some procedures result in higher losses. For example, when we boil a food and then we drain the water, we will lose much more minerals than if we boil and we use the water in our recipe. So this is why we need to be specific to the preparation method used. And when we talk about the preparation method, they are basically divided in three big groups. They are divided in dry heat, moist heat, and cooked with fat or oil. So all ingredients will have its own retention factor for each nutrient, including vitamins and minerals, of course, as I mentioned before. And the nutrient retention factors, they are based in the literature, so we are not going to calculate it for our uh, recipes as the yield factor. The, retention, the nutrient retention factors will be based on the literature. 
And the set of nutrient retention factors that I apply to my recipes is the one published by the European Food Information Resource. In fact, this set is a collection of all published nutrient retention factors that we have available, so this is why I choose this one. It's very comprehensive, it has many different food categories, cooking methods and the nutrients. And I will leave the link here if you want to download the full set of nutrient retention factors from Aerofi. So let's just summarize what we have discussed until now. What we need to do before calculating the nutrient content of a recipe. So first we need to collect the recipe data including the amount of each ingredient and also the yield factor of the recipe. Then we need to check if we have the complete nutrient profile for all ingredients and it's important to mention here that if you are updating or developing a new food composition table this is really a final step in the preparation of your database because at this point we need to have the final nutrient content for each ingredient and this nutrient profile needs to be checked and final so then we can apply the recipe calculation. Then we need to select the appropriate nutrient retention factors for each ingredient and proceed with the calculations and let's see how we should do these calculations. So the mixed method is the recommended procedure for estimating the nutrient content of a recipe and how should we do it. So it means that we need to have the nutrient value for each ingredient. So here in, in this example we have a recipe with only three ingredients. So once we have the nutrient values of each ingredient and that we have checked that they are complete and good quality, we can start our calculations. So in the next step we will select the nutrient retention factor for each ingredient and as I mentioned it is related to the ingredient and also to the cooking method. Then after applying the nutrient retention factor for all the nutrients and all ingredients, we will sum the total for each component. And after making this sum, we will use the yield factor that ideally we have calculated based on our own estimation. We will calculate the final nutrient value in the cooked weight. And to express this information in our food composition table, we need to remember that we will always express these values per 100 grams of foods. So we need to make this conversion to 100 grams of prepared food for all the components. So this is the mixed method where we apply the nutrient retention factors at ingredient level and the yield factor at recipe level. And this is the method recommended by InFoods for calculation of the nutrient profile in food composition tables and databases. So as you could see, this is a feasible procedure for including more recipe data in our food composition tables and databases. But to have a high quality data at the end, you need to follow all the steps that I have presented here. Also, using a software or a standardized file may be very helpful for the calculations itself. And this is why in the next video I will show you how I have created my own recipe calculation template using Excel. And you will have some ideas on how you can make your own template or you will also be able to download the template that I have created. So, see you in the next video.